word. What is God? Is God a creator? Is God our father, our mother? Is God a man? Was a man? Could be a man? Gender fluid? Is God invisible? Or do all that we see that is right is his reflection? So what is God? Does it matter? I think so. I think that's what we're doing here. It's a pretty big universe out there, and there's a lot of life around us. I believe something that happens to be quite consistent with the Torah, I do believe it, that God, here we go, is the creator, and we are made in his image, yes. And where is the proof, they say. Yeah, right, that part. All right, well, think about it. Man has this deep need to create like God, you know, like the way God creates, but obviously like on a much smaller scale, right? I mean, man, like, I mean, from the get-go, he goes right at it, making sandcastles as little kids, snowmen, and then we go to skyscrapers and we create robots and artificial intelligence even. We're now creating our own man just like Papa did in the old days. We're a chip off the old block. God, yes, a chip off the old block. God is an unimaginable presence, seen and unseen, the creator of the universe, earth, life, and is the intelligence that resides underneath all of it. All right, good luck for science to figure that one out, uh, you know, the intelligence part under all of it. Oh, they'll discover all sorts of scientific truths, right? E equals MC square, you know. But they will not be capable through science in discovering the intelligence that created those scientific truths. There's an unimaginable intelligence that created all of them. From two plus two equals four to the DNA double helix. I mean, now surely we could all get on the same page with that, right? The intelligence behind, underneath everything. But I can hear some of you out there going, you're out of your mind, man. You're wrong. It was a series of random accidents that built on each other to create, you know, our present reality. There are many people out there today that believe in some version of that. And it makes me wonder, I'm like, what if we all believed that there was no God, no creator, that the universe and man are just a series of random accidents, and here we are. So if that's like how we were created and everything around us, then that's how man must create as well. You know, right? By accidents. Okay, movies just spontaneously made by random accidents. The latest cameras to shoot the movies just appear. Things are just a bunch of random accidents. Nobody shepherded an idea. Nobody had a creative surge. Just accidents. We are quite limited in our ability to fully comprehend the truth behind all things. But through accidents, and especially our own need and ability to create, we are given a chance. Could it be that accidents are part of God's plan? A way for him to reveal an important truth without revealing his hand? Like, why didn't he just show Edison how to create a phonograph and a diagram and better than a giant cloud? <sighs> Perhaps for us? to maintain free will. We believe it's an accident, and maybe, and probably, it is. But sometimes, sometimes it might be God intervening with man without man knowing. So next time when a wonderful accident happens, just remember, this too could be God at work. Use your limited intelligence and recognize the truth that has been revealed to you by a glorious, glorious accident. God's secret weapon to keep us growing and learning and evolving. Be keenly aware of it because for God, ultimately for man, there are no accidents, only truth revealed. So let's get those accidents going. He performed more times with legendary comedian Sam Kennison and remarkably didn't turn to the enemy, the dark side. By the way, I'm only making that assumption since he's agreed to be on this show. A man who could claim a number one selling comedy album on iTunes. Comedian, actor, the great Jimmy Schubert. Hey. It's been a minute there. Uh, 
<laughs> since I've seen you. It has been a minute. <laughs> it's been a minute. It's moving on. She's an international singing sensation that has performed on Broadway, off Broadway, and even under Broadway. And I've been there, and that's a tough gig. Those Middle Earth crowds, ooh, they are tough, man. Singer, actress, Wanda Houston. Hey, Wanda. <laughs> hey, Scott. How you doing? I'm glad you can make it. <laughs> so glad I could be here. <laughs> He's never met a stage he couldn't conquer, except middle childhood, comedian, actor, and my co-host, Mr. Sandy Danto. There he is. Hey. hey. Scott, I was not an accident, but my parents clearly wanted a girl, judging by my name. Yes, they did. She's been searching for answers her whole life, but she comes here to find the questions. The co-star of the insanely bizarre comedy series Before Future Boy. Did I say Before Future Boy? Yes, I said it. On iTunes, my sidekick, the talented actress, Jackie Van A. Hello. Every time I come here on time, it's an accident. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> All right, when we come back, we're going to dive into Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. And, well, we'll get the accidents going. Welcome back to The Word. <laughs> okay, we are reading uh, Genesis chapter 3. Now, the serpent, yes, the serpent was cunning more than all the beasts of the field that the Lord God had made. And it said to the woman, did God indeed say you shall not eat of any of the trees of the garden? Verse two, we move on. And the woman said to the serpent, of the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. And then we move to verse three, but of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, God said you shall not eat of and you shall not touch it, lest you die. And verse four, and the serpent said to the woman, you will surely not die. <laughs> and verse five, for God knows that on the day that you eat thereof, your eyes will be opened and you will be like angels, knowing good and evil. Wow, well, so the serpent is tricking woman to disobey God and tricking her into eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For many, what woman is about to do is considered the original sin of man. Yes, but what strikes me about these passages is that the serpent, a creation of God as well, right? The animal, God created the animals, is really the one committing the first sin the original sin. Since we are not shown what might have compelled the serpent to do wrong in God's eyes, if one even exists, we are left to believe that the serpent has an innate mischievous quality. And yet, the serpent's behavior is not unfamiliar in our own lives. Oh yeah, <laughs> what compels a serpent, a human, or our, even our best friend to sway a person to commit horribly destructive, soul-crushing, life-threatening activity. And I'm not including a parent saying, you know, you should really go to college, or <laughs> your best friend saying, you should get married like me. I'm not including those, no, I'm not even including, you know, the doctor saying, you should really have a colonoscopy. No, I'm not even including those. I'm including all the others. <sighs> Jimmy Schubert. Yes, Jimmy sir. Jimmy Schubert, you toured with the beast. Yes, the beast, Sam Kennison, a legendary comedian. If you don't know about these things, then surely no one does. If there is some kind of external force that makes us do things we really shouldn't do, or is it something inside us, Jimmy, like a smoldering bad truck burrito? Oh, yeah. That's uh. I don't know what the question was, but uh, yeah, I did. Uh, <laughs> the question was, you were with the beast. Yeah, but you know, I mean, look, but Sam was also a preacher. I mean, Sam uh, loved the word of God. I mean, he just found that he had a bigger pulpit when he went to comedy. I mean, he married people. He prayed with people when they died. Certainly, he got a little lost along the way. I mean, maybe he was in an experiment to test God's love. 
to see if he could do all kinds of things like, you know, and, and still be forgiven. I mean, I don't know what, what his thing was. I mean, I know he had a love for God and, and the word of God. He preached it for God's sakes. He married people and he prayed with people when they passed away. So I think, at, you know, at some point, you know, if you want to believe all the hype, you can say, yeah, he was the beast. He was crazy. Yeah. And sure, he partied, he drank a little bit too much, but, you know, um, I, I think at the end of the day, I think he believed in the word of God. I mean, he loved God like his father did, you know, Sam's father was a preacher. He came from a whole family of preachers. So, yeah, I mean, at, at the end of the day, well, I, I, I think he found a bigger pulpit with comedy than he would have at the church preaching. He understood the word of God. I mean, you, you know, I, I know Sam loved God. You know, I, I think Sam was just... Going through a, you know, I mean, like like pushing the boundaries and seeing what he could get away with, exactly. but uh, you know, but I mean, you know, and he certainly uh, probably did more harm to himself than anybody else, you know, with the drugs yeah. and the drinking and stuff. Yeah. I mean, you know, and which or brings us even, but and or even, I mean, like you said, he, he been pushing the boundaries, but like you said, the anger. I mean, that could have been anger too. Maybe he's mad at God. Maybe he was. Maybe he was working out some of his own issues. Yeah, uh, that's a great point. Yeah, I, you you're know, right. Maybe I he mean, was mad at God. I, yeah. I I agree with that fully. He was. That's you a, know. Yeah. Wow, that was that was good. I don't know how we. <laughs> it's amazing what these verses lead you to talking about, man. We're talking about <laughs> Sam Kinnison's <Kenneth's> act. <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, look, like, I mean I, the serpent. I, yeah, well, it makes sense. You know, well, I, I was there when he got game of the beast. He was like Harvey Elkin. You remember Harvey Elkin, Jimmy Schubert? Jesus, he, Harvey yeah. Elkin, that manager. <laughs> he was used the to, manager of everyone. Everybody. Everyone. As soon as they got big, they left the guy. Everybody left him. But he had, yeah. and he was the one who named Sam the Beast. I was there right. when it happened. All right, so here we go. So, so Wanda, Wanda. Okay. Yeah. So you got yeah. this serpent, right? You got the <laughs> you got this serpent and the, and just out of nowhere there's this serpent going, "Hey man, come on." I think that's the lesson. I mean, the, the that free will thing, you know, and I'm not that I'm saying I mean cuz God is was sitting up there going, oh, "Let's watch and see what she does with this." So I mean, you have to wonder like did did that makes you want to did Eve have some things inside of her like God said we can't have it do I but I really want to know. Did she have something going on like that? I mean, it doesn't say that in the word, but. But, 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 but Jackie, Jackie, what do you think? Like the serpent, right? Is, is there an external part of us? Is this an external voice that, that gets us to do evil? Or is this something that resides inside us? What do you think? I don't know. The whole time you guys were talking and the whole time I read the passage, I don't really think that the serpent's that bad of a guy. I think that, you know, the serpent represents, <laughs> I think he might represent evil, but if God created everything, then God <laughs> created the serpent, right? I don't think in the Bible there's anything here that's pointing at anything being good or bad. Just contrast of black and white. Mm -hmm. Very good. Sandy Danto, I know you've had many inclinations to interrupt other guests with jokes during this show. <laughs> you are right about that. And yet, you didn't interrupt them. Uh, how did you control your mischievous tendencies, Sandy? Funny you should ask, Scott, because uh, I've been thinking this whole time that you could interpret that the serpent is just representation of human nature, the human nature to be defiant, to be curious. But uh, I also thought when you were talking about it being the original sin, it, I wanted to interrupt you and say it feels like an argument out of a Seinfeld episode if he was a little more religious. Like, so you're saying it's the original, original sin? It's the original, original sin, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> what he thought was the original sin, not so original attack. Um, but that, that, and that's thank God you didn't interrupt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't need yeah. to do that. No, that was good. That's, why I, I, I that's why I didn't interrupt. Yeah. It could be that the other animals see man being created last and getting the most autonomy, having the ability to communicate verbally and move on their feet and 
use their hands separately and they're they're jealous and they're mad at God. So they're like, you know, I'm I'm going to trick these humans. I'm going <laughs> to or maybe the serpent first ever reality show producer wanted to see the drama. The Garden of Eden's kind of boring serpent. Just, you know, he wants to create that conflict. Yeah. But it, but is that serpent that voice in us or is it external? And that's all you know. It, it, does anybody know? I think. Why I, not? I, do they have well, to be mutu- Do they have to be mutually exclusive? Can it be? Can it be like uh, external and internal at the right same on. time? By the way, you know what Adam and Eve's first argument was? Damn it, Eve! You put my pants in the salad again. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Damn it, Eve! <laughs> Literally, if somebody told me, just like just like Wanda said, if he's like, you could have anything you want except that, that's going to be the first thing I'm eating. You just Yeah, your- exactly. Sure. And that's what he did. <laughs> and that's why we no longer live in paradise. Thank because you. a woman had to go in there and get the oh, apple no. and make <laughs> apple pie. I got an apple pie recipe. Give me that apple. Let's make some pie. And we no longer live in paradise because of you. If you were Eve, you would have well, ruined all that. It's true. Things. We just... We just lived it. Hey, hey, just hey, lived it. It's true. It's completely true. Here's it never said it's an apple either. It doesn't <laughs> ever say it's an apple. Yeah, where did we get the apple from? I don't know. Why is it always an apple? It was an artist. Yeah, but that's so true. It never said it's an apple. <laughs> 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 it might have been a damn fig. I mean, you know. <laughs> it could have been a fig. <laughs> we'll be, uh, come back. Hopefully God didn't take us all out. back with the word and we're having a lively conversation about uh, serpents good and evil man woman in the garden all sorts of things and we continue with chapter 3 of Genesis verse 6 and the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was a delight to the eyes and the tree was desirable to make one wise so she took of its fruit and this is by the way the tree of knowledge of good and evil she's picking here and she ate and she gave also to her husband with her and he ate it oh boy okay so it seems as if the verse goes out of its way to make clear that that woman on her own volition disobeyed god you know there's no mention of the serpent here <laughs> she's created her own scenario. Sure, the serpent in the previous verse planted the seed in her mind that maybe it's not so bad and it's actually could be kind of good. However, she commits the transgression against the creator on her own free will. Ultimately, we are responsible for our own behaviors, not the messenger of doom. Jimmy Schubert, did you ever blame me? Yes, me and my writing partner, Doug, for the very difficult first year of you doing stand-up when we got you to buy the Star Trek routine. Uh, Hilarious. Uh, No, it was actually good, man. That that was great. I don't don't blame anybody for anything. At the end of the day, I'm the one who makes all these decisions. And if I, if I, if I, you know, if I don't want to do it, I don't do it. I mean, it's, I, I don't blame anybody for anything. My life is mine. I own everything. Whether if I if I come to make a mistake, then yeah, that's on me. That's not on the person I put. Well, you know, we all do that. Whether we do it subconsciously or consciously, we constantly put ourselves in positions for uh, you know incidents to happen to us. Whether we want them, to, you know, whether they're good or bad, or you put yourself in a situation every time I hang out with that guy, you know, you know, <laughs> we we you know we you get drunk or you wind up doing drugs. So why would you hang out with that guy? Why would you do that? You know, I mean, I, if you put yourself in those positions, then obviously things are going to happen. So that's just on me. I mean, I don't well, know if that yeah. answered I mean, your question, but. Because well, I, I think this purse is all about free will. I, th- I think the fact that it goes off on, on this, uh, you know, on her, you know, putting these thoughts in her head now and justifying what she's about to do. Jackie, 
Have you ever done something that you just know is wrong and then create an entire scenario and then believe that scenario and do it? Have you ever no. done that, Jackie? I'm an absolute angel. I'm actually shocked you asked that question. <laughs> oh, I'm asking it, Jackie. And I want to know the dark. <laughs> Once this older man convinced me that he was, oh my, yeah, this is pretty bad. But I was 18. I had just moved to L.A., and uh, he, uh, we had met at a coffee shop or something, and he was a writer, he'd done some stuff, and he had convinced me that he was writing this script and he really wanted me for it, and I was like, awesome. And then as we kept meeting and stuff, he asked me to, he said, I was moving out of my place, and he said, you can live into this apartment that I own, nobody lives in it, and I was like, great. So I go and I move into this apartment that he owns, and then he, Every, like a week comes by and he comes to visit for a day and then he comes to visit for like a couple days and then he starts staying there and then he starts like like now before I know it I'm living in the house with this older man who's like a writer and it was like a month into this and I'm like I just have this like like and I I knew it was weird but he kept the the serpent I guess was <laughs> like hey you're going to you're going to be a movie star. That's kind of like the serpent, like the evilness being like faint just like just do the bad thing that you know you feel in your heart is not right, but you'll get like you but know, it just Isn't it amazing how you take the suggestion and then create the scenario in your head? Sandy, yeah. when we were at National Lampoon, that place seemed filled with serpents. There were projects that they would try to get us to do the work on, like, and they were always like down in Mexico, you know, like <laughs> we want to we send you down in Mexico. There's going to be girls. Remember that? Remember that? They had that Bridget the Midget porno star oh, in the lobby. You were there in a meeting, and you got this Bridget. They tried to get me to write on that. I mean, that, well, uh, Bridget. Well, I'm sitting there having a meeting with you, show. and you guys got a midget in your freaking waiting room that does porno. And she's all tatted up. And I'm going, I'm going to end the meeting with me to meet with this girl. <laughs> like, where, where, where is it? There's just such a comedy. There's a, By the way, a professional comedian. Been, and you're, you're, you're kind of ending my meeting early to meet with this porno. I'm I, I, was, I was basically going to get fired if I, didn't, if I didn't show up at the shoot. And I got to tell you, I ended up talking to Bridget the Midget, the porn star. She was very lovely. She, I, she was... So nice and so, Sandy, you gotta get well, me. Well, you say she was you nice. Gotta save me. I still with got. The Mexican... I, got, I still got a scar on my knee from where she stabbed me. All right. <laughs> Sandy, did you ever? I was able to once in a while, you know, really say no and put my foot down. But were you able to do that, Sandy? Because I think you went to Mexico. <laughs> I wish I. I was trying to get on those Mexico trips. Oh, they God. didn't trust me to do that because they. <laughs> They knew I was the serpent. Oh, <laughs> oh. oh no, you flew. I was like, I, 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 was, I had the malleability to be a serpent in training. But, <laughs> um, so did you ever tell them no? Did you I ever tell them no, no? I told them no a lot when it came to comedy stuff. Like, uh, there, there was one guy, not, not anyone that, that we found. Uh, to be oppressive on an everyday level, but he was always trying to get me to do stuff and to pitch stuff. He had nothing to do with the creative side, and I always told him no, and it was always a problem. Wanda, Wanda, how did you, I mean, being in the business for all these years, you know, like, what can people do to avoid being taken advantage of and creating these scenarios to justify with the serpents whispering in our ear. Is there anything we could do to not allow that to happen? Uh, Scott, I was just really thinking about what you said, you know, and you, you, here you were in, in paradise and, uh, and you know, here comes the, you know, serpent. Yeah, hey, okay, here, can we come over here and do this? I had this guy, I'm sitting and I was in college. I was happy. I was living my dream of <laughs> doing what I wanted to do. And this guy turned to me and he was like, he goes, oh, Wanda, you're so happy all the time. You're so great. You're so, you know, he goes, you should, let's do some LSD. And I was like, really? 
<laughs> he was like, cause yeah, cause I had my closest experience with God on LSD. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, really? You know, you and I am so grateful that I know that I don't need LSD to see God, which is what I told him. I said, I don't, I don't need to do LSD. I said, that sounds great. I said, I've had my closest experience without that. So <laughs> that's a good know, call. Good you know, you, once <laughs> one, one, one time I did cocaine and acid and I saw God and I owed him money. Well, <laughs> we'll continue with Genesis and this, this kind of evil stuff. Genesis chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. Let's get it going here. And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves and made themselves girdles. And they heard the voice of the Lord going in the garden to the direction of the sun. And the man and his wife hid from before the Lord God in the midst of the trees. And the Lord God called to man, And he said to him, where are you? (laughs) Where are you? Where are you? You know, as a parent, you know that where are you? (laughs) Um, When you're raising small children, they're like, there are moments that are so like transcendently wonderful and joyous and innocent. (laughs) Last week, Jackie told us a story of her running through the supermarket naked as a toddler with her parents running after her. And it was so, like, ridiculously adorable. Like, for many parents, these years of child-rearing, although challenging, they're kind of like a Garden of Eden, you know, for the parent and the child. Obviously, God knows where men and women are when he shudders and screams, Where are you? As a parent, you will inevitably have that moment as well. Where are you? How come you're not home? Where are you? you, How come you didn't come home last What's going on? The garden's closed. They've entered the world. They've taken a big gulping bite from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Sandy, Danto. Sandy, do you think it's harder when the garden closes and the kid swallows the fruit from the tree of good and evil? You think it's harder on the parent or is it harder on the child? I think it takes a cosmic toll on the child that comes out later, but it's definitely harder on the parent in the moment. I got really kind of emotional during your your take on that there because when I read it, I was just like, oh, God's inventing the first game of hide-and-go-seek. And you took it to a completely different place. I did. Obviously I did God say. <laughs> knows where they are, but he's he's – kind of playing along like hey where are you guys i i can't see where you guys are i'm gonna come looking for you and uh all that stuff really resonates i've got a two-year-old and it's uh i don't want the the puberty serpent to to start (laughs) from the tree of knowledge of good and evil It, it it should be called in puberty the bush of horniness and acne (laughs) But I don't, I don't think we're meant to live in the garden eternally. I remember several years ago, I was over at a friend's house. I, I stopped in to see him, and he was sitting at his kitchen table, and he was crying because he'd gone through a divorce, and he hadn't seen his child in about six months or eight months. And he was just saying how much he missed her. He goes, I miss her so much. And I said, oh, and I gave him a hug. And I said, man, I'm sorry you're going through that. And he just said the coolest thing to me. He said, now I know how God feels about all of us. Cool. We'll cool. be right back after these yeah. commercial messages. <laughs> well, well, we want to get Wanda's opinion here. Wanda, do you think that, um, you know, is there a sense of uh, pain with God, you know, that uh, his children are about to do something that uh, he kind of hopes never happens? Do you think there's something to that? Do you hear, like, where are you? Where have you been? What are you doing? in these yeah. verses there is that sense of uh, the wonder is gone you know i remember when i 
didn't believe in Santa Claus anymore. And I got to sit up, you know, and I, it was always when we were kids, we would try to sneak and watch what the parents were doing after everyone had gone. We were all put to bed and Santa was going to come. And when that's over, it is so disappointing. It is, it is hard to, when that is gone, when you lose that wonder. <laughs> Jackie, do you, do you think that we could keep that part of our life going for long, that, that blissful childlike period? Is there a way to kind of keep that, keep the Garden of Eden going? Is, are there things that we can do to make that possible? I think, I mean, I love that I'm having this discussion right now because I feel like I'm at a very pivotal point in my life in which, um, I mean, I've definitely chosen like an artist path that we all have because we're here. But um, I get questioned every day outside of myself and within myself because it's risky and because I don't have that fine. I don't have that, you know, comfort of money, like being a nurse or waking up to a job every day. It, it definitely makes you want to to stop believing in your your magical fairy dreams that I have of myself because you don't have that comfort. But I think what helps is to know that the experience of life is each day that you live, it's not the weekends from the work that you have from the comfort that you lived. It's living in that moment of what makes you excited and choosing to do what you want based on your heart and based on these things, even though it's risky, it's taking risks every day. You say security. I mean, you can walk out in the street tomorrow and get hit by a bus and exactly. be the most secure, secure person in the world. I mean, is there security? And no, I mean, you're on your path. And so, and I think you create this garden of Eden by, you know, the information, a diet isn't just the food you put into your body. It's, it's the beauty you fill your soul with. It's the books you read. It's the meditations. It's like, you know, so you surround yourself with people who inspire you. You create this garden of Eden of things that feed your soul. And, and give you purpose to go do what it is that you want to do with your life. I mean, everybody was nobody until they were somebody. And, and everybody was somebody. practicing and beginning until they became somebody. Wow. And listen, you know what I just but, realized, Jimmy? The, the God, when God goes, where are you? God does want us. That's what's so amazing about it. God actually does want us to stay in the Garden of Eden. He wants us to stay in there as long as we can. Like what Jackie's uh -huh. talking about. Look at the effort that she's making to stay in that innocent world, you know, and you, and that you're making. You and know? here comes people running through a bubble garden with a pin, trying to ruin it. Yes. Yeah, they're, they're all over the place. <laughs> um, now, I, I do, uh, by the way, I, I don't do many impressions, but I do do Abraham Lincoln. Now, do you oh. want the real Abraham Lincoln or do you want the one from Star Trek? Because I do them both. Do them both. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm I, kidding. I, That's... I, I can't. It's as hard as uh, figuring out the Torah. Yeah, yeah, uh, I can't yeah. answer that question. All right, look. Uh, when we come back, we'll wrap. The, uh, we're going to last segment. Okay. All right. With it. Okay, we're back, and we are reading Genesis chapter 3, verse 10 through verse 19. Okay, and let's get going. And he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I'm naked, so I hid. All right, so the reason I'm not going to cover any of the naked stuff, we did a whole show on the naked thing, so we're going to just blow by this, okay? And we continue with verse 11. And he said... Who told you that you are naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And verse 12, and the man said, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, so I ate. In verse 13, and the Lord God said to the woman, what is it, what is it that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent enticed me and, and I ate. 
verse 14. And the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed be you more than all the cattle and more than all the beasts of the field. You shall walk on your belly and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And now the punishments begin. Your classic grounding, literally. Verse 15. And I shall place hatred between you and between the woman and between your seed and between her seed. He will crush your head and you will bite his heel. Verse 16. Verse 16. To the woman, he said, I shall surely increase your sorrow and your pregnancy. In pain you shall bear children. And to your husband will be your desire. And he will rule over you. Verse 17, and to man he said, because you listened to your wife and you ate from the tree from which I commanded you saying, you shall not eat of it. Cursed be the ground for your sake. With toil shall you eat of it all the days of your life. Verse 18, and it will cause thorns and thistles to grow for you and you shall eat the herbs of the field. And in verse 19, with the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, for you were taken therefrom. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. All right. A lot there, but, uh, you know, there's some horrible punishments here. Yes, but man will rule over her is so profoundly out of sync with today's reality. What do I do? Should I give up? Should I stop the show? Should I pick what verses I like and then validate my belief system and throw out the ones that don't apply like this one and just pretend it's not there? And how many religious people do such things? I promised myself I wouldn't do that. I know there's a God, and I know that this Torah is pretty important to him. But wow, this is a test. So what is this? Rule over her? It's certainly not a commandment. It's not a commandment. No, it's a sentence. The sentences have been served. So... Let's just hope man doesn't have to pay reparations on this one. I could barely pay my rent. Sandy Danto, we'll start with you. What the hell did I just say? Scott, there's a lot here. First, Adam is very quick to throw his partner and, might I add, the only other living human around under the bus <laughs> to God. It is a punishment. It is a sentence. And, and just like any punishment aside from a death sentence, there's room for parole, reduced sentence due to good behavior, overcrowding. God was like, good, now you're stuck with her. You have to date her and live with her, man. I hope you're happy. <laughs> I hope you're happy. You're going to marry her. You're going to give I... half of your stuff. You're never going to be able to sleep with anybody as long as you live. I hope you're happy. You ate for the tree, and now you get what you got. You got to live with her. <laughs> yeah. I'm done. It dusted his hands, and that's what I think he meant by that. Well, well, I, <laughs> I'm kidding, a, Jackie. I'm kidding. I know no, you're no, kidding, no, but there's some people that won't. <laughs> no, but there's, I mean, but there are some people who really think that way, and and there's people who think, you know, the other way that that it it doesn't apply to us anymore, and there's people who also think that that it still and it it still goes that way, and it's still that's the way it needs to it needs to go. I mean, you know, I've heard people say, you know, I'm the head of my household, and, and what happens in my house, my woman does this for me. I there are people who still believe that way scott and you know that's true no but they still you know, believe it, it but, really but a woman it does not in this era a woman does not have to i mean there's enough information now at least in our society that you do not have to there are so many groups that will come out of their, the woodwork to help you you know get out of that kind of situation what kind of situation is that the fact that you love to, your to man? be ruled over to be lorded over by a man 
You mean a guy who spoils you and buys you a house and gives you children and takes care of you and works every yeah, day so he, he can feed you and put clothes on your him. back? Is if that you talk back to him or you make his food wrong, he could stab you or put your face onto the stove, which happens wow. a lot. <laughs> like Syria. <laughs> I mean, I, that's what I'm serious? saying. It hasn't changed. That's that still stuff happens. Up. There's literal news articles right oh, now of women getting ver like incredibly abused just today. Just now, you can look it up. Well, I, I agree. I agree. It still happens. I agree. It still happens. But generally speaking, and all we could go that most people do not think that way anymore. No. Yeah. Well, you know what? I, I, I really believe that. I disagree. But it's only recently. Like, very well, you know what? You know, it's interesting. I always hear women talk about that, about men like that, like that, and that whole thing. And my mom had six boys, and she beat it into her heads. But you know, that's that's what happens. I mean, women raise men. Women raise men. So you should actually spend some time with these men so they know how to treat their queen, not somebody you're ruling over, but somebody you love and somebody you care mm -hmm. for and somebody you do everything for. And somebody that, you know, you know I, I don't know what this concept of, I want an equal. I want a peer. I want somebody whose opinion I respect. I want somebody to go back and forth with. I don't want to rule over anybody. I want I want you to have your own life, your own goals, your own dreams, your own visions. I want you to take care of yourself. I don't want to, I mean, you know, in fact, I probably, I'm probably a better cook than most women I meet. You know why? Because I like eating a certain way. My place is spotless because I'm OCD. You ever go in a woman's bathroom? It's a mess. Well, we'll be right back after these commercial messages. <laughs> We're back at the final thing where we actually ask people what they learn, and let's keep it to 15 seconds. Okay, here we go. Wanda, what did you learn today? I learned that uh, that there are things that we need to look at differently sometimes than the way we think. It's not always exactly the way you think. And I learned today that uh Ruling doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to continue forever. And what God says doesn't necessarily mean that it means forever, that things can change and we're allowed to change. We have we can be different. So I learned that today. Very good. Sandy. I learned that um, Adam and Eve were tested and they passed the test. Paradise maybe a little overrated. I've been to resorts. I get bored sitting by the pool for too long. Got to venture out into the world, see what else there is to offer. And it's usually the, the rancid food that makes you get off the ship. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy. Yes, sir. What'd you learn? It's a, it's a, it's a good question. What did I, I learn? I, I mean, obviously I'm, you know, I have a lot to learn is what I learned. Very nice. And Jackie, what did you learn, Jackie? That was a really wise thing to say. Um, I learned that women should be more appreciative of the things that men go through because sometimes when you sit and you think about all the things that, you know, you could have better you bypass and don't think about how there's people going through everybody goes through things i think what i learned is that we're all equally going through hardships and i don't think anyone has it better off or bet or worse than another very nice and that's it and i've learned to wrap this up right now <laughs> Oh,
God. So the hey. love of God. I'm not wearing any underpants right now, and that probably explains the danger from my shoes. Listen. <laughs> Listen. Whose idea was it to invite Jimmy Schubert to the f***ing Bible study? That's what I want to know. I want his name. I want his number. I want him thrown out. 